Okay. So, welcome back, everyone. We're in our funnel push here. Um, but in this funnel push, I want to talk about a subject near and dear to my heart. One that I think has enormous significance, whose advent has enormous significance for modeling, for dynamic modeling. And it's really to stay nimble as learning takes place during the modeling process. But it also has great significance for training. Training of the next generation, such as those in the room and those in the virtual room. Um, because it points to the imperative of, of, of educating individuals in multiple modeling methods. In my undergraduate course on modeling and its graduate analog, um, I have notable models, modules on the three types of modeling with a particular emphasis on agent-based and system dynamics, um, but also talk about discrete event simulation. And uh, I argue, um, in that class, and I, I submit in front of, to you today, that while system science traditions date back decades as separate separate um, and, and independently uh, originating lineages, they're highly complementary. What they have in common is greater than their differences. Um, and different methodologies seek to differ, to, to answer often different questions, but seek to, to be able to address different needs often within a, within a model. And, and no one system science methodology offers any sort of replacement for the others, but the fact is that significant synergies, not merely complementary, but synergies, can be secured by using combinations methodologies to address, to address a common problem, a common set of problems, common, common domain. Uh, and, and, and I think I'll modify that to say a common domain, um, uh, a common um, context uh, and domain. Um, and once again here, when we're talking about synergies, we're talking about whole greater than the sum of the parts. And, and really what we can get out from these modeling, these hybrid modeling approaches are, are whole greater than the sum. Now, there's lots of motivation for this, and I could spend much of, you know, many minutes just on this slide, but we don't have that luxury. There's, it turns out there's many motivations for the use of hybrid approaches. Um, and surprising, these have been surprisingly um, poorly articulated, I think, in, in the literature. There, there's some rich discussion of hybrid modeling quarters, but some of them are, some of these are, are really not, I haven't seen really any um, deep discussion. Um, there's no question that different methods offer different comparative advantages. Um, and uh, each of the methods has its domain of strength where it's incredibly expressive, powerful, sometimes general, um, and, and uh, nimble to, to be applied. Discrete event simulation when you have structured workflows, resource constrained progress along those workflows and your interest in things like throughput, waiting times, waiting lists, and how that vary with resource availability, placement, um, level of resourcing. Um, when you have different analysis needs across different spheres of a model, maybe some depicting clinical flow, others depicting population and health context, but some of the deeper motivations have to do with the ability to nimbly evolve. 
to evolve in an agile fashion as small wing develops, um, and the ability to secure the stakeholder risk. Um, there are also times where we 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 use these to secure advantages of computational efficiency. Um, to great effect. And, and a topic I won't have time to talk about, multi-scale modeling is also, you know, a, a, a driver for use of some of these. Um, now, any logic platform and, and some other platforms in, in to growing degree as well, um, seek to enable at least some degree of hybrid modeling. Um, for any logic, this has long been a, a major literal selling point of the platform. Um, and, and it has a notable advantage for building um, multi-scale models. But in the interest of both time and practicality, I, I want to emphasize five predominant, compelling, and increasingly um, well-represented in the literature, hybrid health models. Um, and I'm going to have to hew to the essence of brevity in describing this. Um, we're going to go through each in turn, but I've listed them here uh, collectively. And the first I want to talk about is service, po um, uh, service population interaction. You've seen many elements of this, and, and I, I don't want to belabor the point, but I want to remind us. So if we read the open, that model we had earlier, so it actually has now a, a, a different label, it's not version three, but we had it open not two hours then, it's, uh, probably or three, multi-clinic SIS hybrid saturation effects and lock-in, if you might remember that. Mm. Um, here we go. This is a model which depicts in Maine, a, uh, a fulsome population with, with people, um, but beyond that, and, and there's people in homes and infection may sp spread within homes. Um, but people's recovery in this model is treatment mediated. Perhaps it's uh, the need to secure antibiotics and the need to secure uh, drugs that would clear hep C or what have you. Um, and the evolution of the public health side of these individuals, um, the health of the population is intertwined with, in ways you'll recall, with um, service delivery, health service delivery in the form of clinics and healthcare workers. And you'll recall that there's care seeking that goes on. Um, if an individual is infective and symptomatic, hence this so-called guard is true, this transition is eligible for firing. That's what the guard indicates, this guard has to be true for this um, transition to fire, only if it's true. And periodically we re-examine whether it's true by leaving and coming back in. But if it is true with a certain probability per day, they'll start uh, transit to care. So on average, 1.3 days, they'll, or one and one third days, they'll, um, so one day in eight hours or, or 32 hours, they'll, they'll on average uh, take, if they're infective and symptomatic, they'll take the transit to care. And when, and they will go in that transit to the nearest clinic. You may recognize this now from having built up those models, both in GIS and in, spatially explicit non-GIS modeling, this move to construct. And when they arrive, which you may also remember, um, they arrive at their destination. Here, they are taken into a clinic and they then enter this workflow. You may recall that if they wait too long for treatment, they leave um, without being seen. If they are they do successfully wait for treatment according to the number of healthcare workers. It's in a timely fashion. They flow down here with a certain probability. They're successful in their treatment. Otherwise, there's a treatment failure, and they depart in any case for home. 
unaware of whether or not, for sure, a treatment failure or success has taken place. So this model, as we've seen many times, and I need not belabor it, I'm going to run this single clinic high illness hazard, exhibits this kind of um, intertwining a public health effect and, and um, clinic operation and, and clinic service. We can add additional clinics through a button such as this. We can also go in and in principle resource from the get-go. And here in Maine, there's parameters for count of clinics, count of healthcare workers per clinic that will allow us to, to change that. So this is a model which exhibits this kind of service population interaction. It reflects the fact that public health is not a solitude from service delivery, especially in many areas, whether it's testing, whether it's vaccination, rollout, whether it's features associated with screening, whether it's contact tracing, they're often tied together. Um, and we use this uh, approach in many cases for both communicable architectures as well as um, for chronic diseases, such as uh, for chronic kidney disease and end-stage renal disease secondary to type 2 diabetes. Um, and, you know, these can answer joint questions. Discrete event modeling is the language used to articulate, discrete event simulation is the language used to articulate this workflow. This workflow is based on discrete event simulation, um, whose blocks are shown here, which is an exquisite approach for capturing resource-constrained flow along structured workflows, um, where in this case, entities, in this case, patients flow down and are routed and, and wait according to availability of resources. Um, it's ideal for examining how many people per day we can handle or how long it takes someone to go through the process or how long the waiting times are, how long the waiting lists are, et cetera. Discrete event simulation is a tool of art for those sort of service related questions. And it's quite transparent. You can, and there are, there's a significant history of, of engaging in participatory fashions with stakeholders to look at models of this sort and, and secure feedback. This is a different language than the language of agent-based modeling alone, but it's a highly complementary one. And you saw in this model, perhaps, a glimpse of how individuals could go into a clinic. They in the nearest clinic, they say, hey, clinic, take me in, okay? Take me on, there we go. Um, and they enter at this point. This walk-in is precisely what is, 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 is being referred to here. You take this agent in and uh, they flow through this workflow accordingly. They leave this workflow, but before that, they may be conferred um, with a certain probability they will leave in a way that is successful. And if it is successful, we'll send this agent a message saying that they are to use a rather lay term for it, cured of their malady. So they go back from an infective and symptomatic state to a susceptible state. They're cured of their affliction. So, so it's through this treatment mediated recovery that they go back. Ladies and gentlemen, this is, this is how this is coupled back to, the, to these uh, state charts. So we see this interplay between it. Service type affects presentation, you know, might affect presentation of entities, might have be, um, uh, behavioral counseling going on for individuals who have presented too many times. You might simulate the effects of motivational interviews. You might simulate the effects of 
behavior change efforts um, in the clinic, which would then affect behavior in the population, and behavior in the population affects the likelihood of representation. Service quality and trust violations, the occurrence of stigmatization within the clinic might affect their propensity to, to, to come back. Um, and interventions in the population, public health interventions might affect service demand in the clinic. The load of patients coming to the clinic might be much smaller if you have effective uh, public health measures in place. Immunizations might be simulated in a similar way. Wait, yes. Thanks. Um, and um, you get this interplay between public health and service delivery. Compared to pure ABM, time was. I walked with the young man's shoes and we built models of this sort, purely an agent based modeling. And it is awkward, it is expensive, it can be error prone. And um, it's a lot less nimble. Assembling a nice CES structure um, is, is quite simple for one trained in it. Um, it's quite transparent compared to what comes about if you purely implement it as an agent-based model. And the whole here is truly greater than the sum of the parts. Now, I'd like to talk about a second pattern, if I may. Um, and this one is another one of which we've made generous use in our work, but which others have employed on occasion as well. Um, Jenna has made notable use of it in a colorectal cancer uh, context, also in the context of homeless individuals and, um, and service needs there. So here we have an individuated population represented as individuals, that is in an agent-based way, in a broader aggregate population. And we kind of zoom in to the population of greatest interest. So the idea crudely, and I've illustrated it in a childishly simple diagram here, and I apologize for my artistic failures, is you have a general population, and maybe that population has some risk segmentation associated with it. Um, maybe it's individuals at risk, um, youth at risk of pro-criminal involvement um, or at risk of um, uh, mental health distress or of substance use. And there might be some, some progression which, which involves greater levels of, of risky behavior in some cases, maybe not in others. But at some point in the risk continuum, you individuate, you you render individuals into agents, into individual people. This is the language of stocks and flow, general population adverse population. We're just counting in a cross-sectional way the count of people who match certain characteristics. We may stratify it. We may have adverse population of certain ages and certain sexes and, and certain socioeconomic categories, maybe income deciles or what have you. But at the end of the day, these are counts of people with certain characteristics. There's no representation of individuals in their history, their particular lived experience, their adverse childhood experience. It's at the point where they are turned into individuals that we can start to follow them in a detailed way. And this sort of design is very readily accomplished within any logic. Um, uh, and it's been widely used. So in our COVID-19 work, QM10 from my group um, was worked on model um, and uh, Health Quality Council um, kindly um, uh, allowed her to do this on kind of on the side of the desk uh, for much of her time there. and. Towards the end, uh, allows um, brought together model challenge sessions, etc. But um, the goal was to have a, a nimble platform for looking early on at um, a capacity planning for acute care workflow and resource allocation methods. This was about June 2020 in the opening months of the pandemic, and the idea is we had a. Um, 
Uh, we had a uh, a model here, a stock could flow model. And if this looks, looks complex, um, uh, it is the result of many midnight sessions in the opening months of the pandemic. And I apologize if sometimes the urgency overcame the aesthetic concerns. Our concern was to save lives, not to make pretty pictures. And uh, we, we spread down here, individuals became uh, agents. And uh, as, as agents, they could flow into a representative of service delivery within various hospitals in Saskatchewan, for example. And we could capture things such as the effects of comorbid conditions in different areas of the province. We also captured aspects of an individual's age and sex and, and risk factors beyond that, um, effects of social distancing. And the point is that individuals were captured at an aggregate level, not as individuals, but as counts, but they turned into agents, in this case, when infected. They could have turned into agents when contact traced, for example, instead, even if they weren't infected. But they turned into agents in ways that then flowed through service workflows. Um, it could have been contact tracing workflows. It's very common and we've used it in quite a few projects now. Um, it is easily accomplished and I will show you a model illustrative of that. So if we go to any logic now and we close down this model, multi-clinic model, I would invite you to go download an additional model here. So in the participant resources, there's an example models area. And uh, within this, there's a hybrid modeling subfolder, which is recommended by many such examples. Um, and there's a budding hybrid SDABM that I built um, many moons ago to illustrate the essential elements of this. It, this is not a, an inspiring model, but it's one that shows the essential components. So I just downloaded it by right-clicking and downloading. And I apologize for the remote attendee, so I'll get um, this more suitable. And if we open it up, excuse me, um, I need to, Get it from downloads here. We see the essential structure here. So we have non-diabetics, and once they become diabetic, they will flow into a stock where they're going to be created as agents. So you can imagine this is a long chain of of, of stocks and flows. I've only shown it as one, but it could be a you know a, a much longer chain, such as um, uh, was present. Uh, something like here. Um, we've had, you know, stages of obesity and prediabetes or what have you. But once they flow down here, uh, there's a trigger which fires. This is an event. We've seen events before. We've seen events to go off um, at certain times, perhaps weekly to summarize some data from the model, etc. Here, this goes off under a certain condition. And what is that condition, pray tell? It is that this stock is greater than a value of one. So if there's at least one agent to be created, this, this um, uh, event will fire and we will create agents into the population. And this shows one way agents can be created. If the agents had parameters, we would specify parameter values here. Um, from their stratification category or, or other factors. But fundamentally, we're adding to the population of agents in a manner that would be similar to what we're doing if people are born or immigrated to the model. So here, agent, there's, there's a, a stock and flow, a cross-sectional workflow in an aggregate fashion that's upstream. <coughs> And then at a certain point, agents are, are, are individuated. Um, why do this? Well, um, one really valuable reason for this, one 
incredibly valuable reason is the fact that within these models, we secure enormous computational efficiencies. So we can run a model where only 10% of the population or 5% of the population is agents, much more faster than where 100% of the population of the province is agents. So we, if, we, if we feel that an individual is not a vocal interest for a model right now, we leave them as a as a count in these cross-sectional values. It's only once they enter the focal population of interest, we turn them in. And, and we can run this model perhaps 10 times faster, perhaps 20 times faster. More than that, it allows focusing our modeling effort in, in a more detailed way, our agent-based modeling effort, or more detailed modeling effort on individuals at greatest risk. I stood here before you, not four days thence, and argued, submitted to you that um, when we represent something in our model, inevitably, because of the shortage of time, we are leaving something else out. There is an opportunity cost for putting X into the model. It excludes some um, often ill-considered Y and Z and A and B and C. There's limited time. And if we put it into X, we're not putting it into Y or Z. And here, we can put our efforts into representing the agents, still capture in a rich way, supported by soft and flow modeling, by the system dynamics tradition, capture meaningful dynamics, dynamics upstream. But we don't have to represent that with the level of detail that we do our focal population. In our focal population, we could have, using the, the previous uh, compelling pattern, we could have flow through service pathways, et cetera. This is a very fine-grained um, or very um, fine tool for both tuning computational performance, capturing our attention in the focal population of interest, and al allowing us to easily change the boundary of exactly where we become individuated as agents. Maybe right now it's when people get infected, maybe earlier, maybe we'll bring it up earlier when people get contact traced or when people are having contacts with others who are infected or what have you, we'll turn them into agents then. So we can change the boundary between what's captured in the aggregate level, socks and close, what's captured in an agent level using agent-based modeling or in discrete effect simulation. So this is a, a second pattern, a pattern that involves um, at once part of a model that's an aggregate and part of a model that's agents, okay? Use your greater detail for the things where it matters most. Put your efforts into the things where they yield the greatest return and uh, be aware of the opportunity costs um, uh, for uh, when you're investing in, um, uh, in, in certain detail. Okay, let's talk about system dynamics driven agent evolution. So another very common pattern, one we published once again, um, gosh, uh, maybe it's approaching a dozen um, papers now. Um, so here, the idea is that we, we have some elements within an agent. Maybe the agent is a community service. Maybe it's a community-based organization. Maybe it's a person. Um, and we simulate something in it. Maybe it's a household or a workplace or a school. And we simulate something in it using stocks and flows. So this is kind of a multi-scale approach, and I'd like to introduce you to it with two examples. Um, so the first of them uh, will be one where we have some physiological, or in this case, um, immunological knowledge. And uh, to see this, I'd like to go back to our hybrid models folder, and I'd like to download from here... Um, uh, this one that's uh, CTL state variable. This is 
Okay, now I'm wondering though, this might not load since it's from AnyLogic 7, and I'm not sure, Eric. Yeah, this I'm, I'm afraid this one won't load in this version of AnyLogic because of, of this. Um, so let me let me let me go try that. And if not, we'll we'll use another one here. Um okay. Yes, it does load. Okay. That's no problem. Okay. Um, so despite its name, it might have been updated to any logic eight. Okay, so what we're seeing here is um this is a gosh, this is like circa 2009. Um, a student, David Vickers, and I were working in chlamydia. And we have a number of papers published in that area, some of them related to Saskatchewan data at the time. But um, we have individuals uh, within a population of people. Um, uh, familiar age-based modeling structure. Uh, and you'll find this population of people here within uh, within this this um, model. Um, and each person, critically, their evolution is dictated by two things. One is a state chart, which is singularly discrete in its rather stark characterization of living. Um, so individuals are either alive or they die. Now, what governs whether or not when, when and if they die is this condition. And you'll notice this condition refers to a fatal viral level threshold. So if, if their viral load goes too high, they will perish. And this V is over described in a theory based model based on work by Nowak and maybe Wadars as well, dominant Wadars, Nowak, I think, at uh, Princeton, involving viral dynamics, involving the growth within an individual of three variants. X is uninfected cells, Y is infected cells, think cells in the epithelium. Um, and Z here, or Z for our US viewers, is, is um, a representation of the immune response, or strength of immune response. It's um, uh, cytotoxic T lymphocytes. Um, elaborations of this model we've worked with have undifferentiated and are on uh, precursor and effector cells. Um, uh, CTLs, I think, but this is kind of a, a, a more aggregate view of it um, based on a published model by Noak et al. And here, the uh, the strength of immune response kills off infected cells. But if infected cells are not killed off, they will breed more free variants in the body. So there's this infection process that occurs in the body. Someone is infected by others. That's this top flow downwards from other individuals. I get free variants in my body. They infect new um, cells, uh, uninfected cells to become infected cells. Those infected cells are growing because of that, the spread of infection in the body, but it triggers growth of an immune response in return which then serves to kill off the infected cells. Infected cells, however, that are not killed off breed more free variants. So there's this infection process within the very body that spreads among cells and with free variants. So this is a theory-based model of how infection works, a theory-based model of how infection spreads within the body. And critically, our motivation for looking at this our central motivation was to be able to understand the impact of not only drugs, so pharmaceuticals on, on impacting this, not only impact of things like antivirals um, on uh, the strength of, of an individual's ability to overcome viral infections, but also to represent within a model different levels of immune competence, different levels of immune system strength. And the idea is that, for example, by measuring by changing beta or C here, we can capture elements of 
how a person's body, how aggressively it responds and how quickly it responds to, to infection. And by so doing, we could see simultaneously how that affects how quickly they muster a response, how quickly they recover, how strong that response is, and how, how high the viral load level goes within them. And by implications, do they spread infection to others? So this variance from neighbors is occurring, as you might guess, anyone want to guess? How is one person infecting another? How does an agent often infect another? Through what construct in a model, an agent-based model, does one agent often infect another? Through a, uh, begins with an N, ends with a K. It is a T in the middle. And network. network, good, yes, it's through a network. So variance through network neighbors, this could say, okay? Um, so I spread, load to my neighbors. And if I'm purely immunocomp if I'm immunocompromised, I might have a high viral load. That might make me shed more to neighbors that infect them, but it also may lead to the viral load going so high that it kills me. And then I disappear from the model. Let's go run this. We're going to run it first with a higher fatal viral load threshold. That will mean um, fewer people will exceed it. Here we go. I'm going to run this model. And okay. Um, so what's going on here? Individuals are these dots in this network. They're connected to each other in this network. Any given individual has a viral load shown by the color of red. So if it's dark, it's bright red, they have a very high viral load. The strength of their immune response is indicated by the width of this of this um, uh, of this um, of this circle. So what's going on is people are getting infected in this network, and Upon infection, their viral load starts to go up quickly. But their immune response, so this is a very high viral load, but their immune response is quite large, and, or it's getting larger and larger, and then it overcomes the viral response. It kills off a lot of these, uh, these, uh, these infected cells, which means less in the way of free variants, and the person starts to recover, assuming that the viral load hasn't gone above that fatal viral load threshold. And yet, their high viral load infected others, and it proceeds along the chain. And some people are now getting reinfected here by, the, by this viral load. But they've retained some immune strength, which means those secondary infections often don't lead quite to such large pronounced swings in terms of viral load. They're able to keep it under, under containment, much as if, if one of us were to get infected by COVID-19 now, having perhaps been exposed to it previously, having some vaccination, our level of degree of, of illness won't be quite as virulent. So this is the idea. Of course, down at the individual level, what's occurring is People's developing dynamics, and you know they have a certain strength of immune response uh, over time uh, as they're getting exposed to infection, and as their immune system is countering earlier infections. This is all a theory-based model on factors within a person, and what age-based modeling has brought to the table here is linking them up to each other, having one affect the other. Being able to look at the impacts of immunocomprom uh, immun being immunocompromised or, or immunocompetence, levels of immunocompetence, or even of drug delivery, or even of um, vaccination on not just that person, but the spread of infection over the network. This is emblematic of a class of models where we have some sort of theory, immunological theory, physiological theory, about what's going on. And there's a broad class of those models. Wait one more blink. Um, 
So um, some of those models involve immunology. We have a, a number that we've on which we've published. Some of them involve things like glucose insulin system for, for diabetes. Some of them might involve weight change and people's weight regulation and body weight, uh, body composition change over time, fat and fat-free masses in their body, et cetera. But there's a lot of theory out there at an individual level, and this sort of modeling puts it together. So here we have agent evolution dictated by theory within a person. But I want to highlight another model with your leave. Time runneth on, and we're going to need to, to bring this to a close to, um, to put an emphasis on projects um, presently. But I'm going to go down to environmental contamination hybrid. It's in the hybrid modeling area, appropriately enough. There we go. I'd like you to download it. There we go. I'd like you now to, to open it. This is a model which has a similar kernel of an idea, but also weaves together some important elements that we explored yesterday and even this very day. So here, ladies and gentlemen, we have persons, and these persons can be in a susceptible state, a shedding state, or recovered. Now, importantly, infection can spread through one mechanism. Besides the initial person who's infected, it can spread through one mechanism, environmental mechanism. It does not spread person to person. Think norovirus, um, uh, with with fecal oral transmission, something something that gets into the environment, or think um, cholera, um, where it pollutes a, a water supply. Um, uh, we might have environmental impact and think pathogens associated with prions or Hertzfield Jakob disease or what have you, or spread of of uh, CWD, chronic wasting disease. So here we have. Um, Individuals who can progress from a susceptible state to an effective state by virtue of exposure to pathogen in the environment. Where is that environment? Well, you might have guessed through the agents that we have workplaces and we have homes. But both of them are characterized, ladies and gentlemen, by pathogen reservoirs. And said pathogen reservoirs exhibit dynamics that involve buildup of pathogen from shedding of individuals who are sick and decay of pathogen a certain, according to a certain time constant dictated by environmental conditions. So under cooler conditions, you might have and desiccation, less humidity. You might have pathogen on surfaces dying off over time. But otherwise, if people are shedding in that space, it might build up. So the idea is that we have these environmental pathogens. Those are built up by sick individuals. And in turn, reflective of the reciprocal causality that is characteristic of and a classic hallmark of complex systems, it can expose individuals. Ladies and gentlemen, this model also involves mobility in a fashion true to what we've been exploring in the last day. So people have off time at work and work time, and they go to work and work, and then they go home. Um, so this is a simpler model than we've seen uh, before, but uh, their workplace is pathogen reservoirs, and alas, their home, while it may be a castle, is no refuge. It's no sanctuary. It too has a pathogen reservoir that can afflict a family. Ladies and gentlemen, let us run this model and see its logical consequences of the theory so presented. So we're going to run it. And and here we see a rather fulsome, uh, aesthetically or 
or at least visually fulsome treatment. So we have in the baseline, in the simulation here, we have uh, homes and we have, um, I'm going to I'm going to run it with a smaller population in the interest of time here. I think I'll do medium population. Let's do it with that. It'll be less uh, aesthetically uh, overwhelming. Um, and here we go. So, ladies and gentlemen, we seed the model um, with some initial pathogen. There's one infected individual who, perchance, has come back from from overseas with infection, and uh, that individual is in one of these homes initially, but during the day, they go to work um, and uh, they're present at work. And notice that this home has gotten infected. Each home is, is, has its infection level indicated by this square next to it. And actually, this one looks like it may be coming from this factory. So now people who work at that factory are bringing pathogen back to their home. It's contaminating the homes distressingly. Um, it's also contaminated because of people who might have been in the same home as someone who worked in this factory. It's it's contaminated this workplace, and yay, this workplace, and verily, this one in wet as well. So infection is spreading now in the population, um, and you'll notice that uh, workplace pathogens go up, and then they decline. Why do you think that they decline um, in this kind of periodic stair-like fashion. Anyone want to guess? Because during the day, what happens? So it builds up during the day from shedding people, and then at night, when they're off, it decays. Yeah, they go home, exactly. And, uh, and um, home pathogens are over here, uh, over here, um, and uh, the home pathogens, you'll notice when this is going down, this is going up, right? And so here we're, we're catching pathogens as they accumulate in the home and as they accumulate in the workplace over time, and it's driving infection within the population. And of course, over time, um, things uh, start to uh, to run out, it's it's uh, there's uh, fewer people who are remaining susceptible. Growing number of people are recovered, and the infection starts to die down in the population. The wave is passed. Pathogen reservoirs still exist, and individuals, uh, some individuals are still ill, but they're increasingly recovering from infection, and this slides down to very low levels indeed. So this too is a hybrid model where we have homes and workplaces evolution driven by, um, by stocks and flows. Uh, we have similar models for West Nile, um, et cetera. Um, and I, I presented others, anemia and agents, environmental contamination is what was shown, GDM, gestational diabetes would be another one. We have considerable number of published models of this sort, some of them quite articulated and, and quite evidence-based. Um, I'll finally just comment on two, and I wanna keep my comments very brief here. Number one, agents drive aggregate system dynamics. So here the idea is we have an agent population, maybe it's tobacco companies, maybe it's um, uh, food, big food uh, promoters, maybe it's you know those who sell sugar sweetened beverages. Maybe the Asian population is um, represents adverse institutional actors in terms of spreading misinformation. But we can represent these, whether it's companies driving the commercial determinants of health, as my colleague Sandro Galea writes about in a recent book, um, or whether it's components uh, associated with with spread of uh, protective behaviors or risk behaviors, we we can have some institutions or or or, or community actors, civic society organizations reflected as agents, and maybe it drives an overall stock flow model representing the population as a whole. So here we simulate 
perhaps networks of organizations involved in early childhood education and and um, uh, developmental needs of children and and um, uh, early childhood enrichment, and they affect the dynamics of the population uh, in the model. Um, I don't think I'll show one, but there's a basic health economics model that's kind of of this flavor where we are simulating uh, quality adjusted life years lived and life years lived and cost across the population. And actually we have individuals um, within, that, within that model. Finally, I'll just note that there are some models quite compelling where aggregate system dynamics might affect the agent evolution. Um, so we might have, and I apologize for the aesthetic affronts um, accompanying this slide, but we might have West Nile virus where we have um, mosquitoes represented as compartments in a soft flow model. It would be a fit of folly, I think, all those who live in Saskatchewan here would agree. It would be a fit of folly to try an agent-based model of every mosquito in Saskatchewan. As King Lear said famously, that way lies madness. Um, and we don't attempt that. Instead, we have a stock flow model, a model which characterizes using aggregate system dynamics, um, mosquitoes that are in successive stage of eggs, pupae, larvae, and then uninfected adults, and then infected adults, and then recovered adults. Um, and um, this, this one must be infected here, but um, uh, and those individuals infect people as agents. So, and particularly individuals who are immunocompromised, have weaker immune systems, may have transplants and taken immunosuppressive drugs, what have you. They're affected by West Nile disproportionately, and we have an ancient population of people. Here, the environmental risks and the reservoir populations of birds, for example, um, perhaps other dead end hosts like, like horses, might be represented in an aggregate way where we just have cross sectional depiction that comes. But they're affecting agents, they're affecting people, individual people who can be followed longitudinally in their care system interaction and the risk factors, heterogeneity, et cetera. Um, right. Um, okay. Um, I think I will stop my comments there, if I may. Um,